Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. I'd like to share something with you from um, Psalm 119. You know, Psalm 119 is the the longest chapter in the Bible, which is kind of interesting because it really focuses on the most important thing in the Bible, and that is um, prayers in relationship to walking in obedience to the Word of God. It's a very strange chapter in that um, the what appear, appears to be subtitles are actually the the uh, Hebrew alphabet, or actually they call it the Aleph Bet, Aleph Bet being the first two letters of their alphabet, which is the Aleph and the Beth, which is the first chapter, the first subtitle here in Psalm 119 is the Aleph, and then Beth is the second. And as you go on down, uh, the rest of the letters of their Aleph Bet are used with eight verses following each letter. And the beginning of each eight verses uses the letter that is being spoken or or is being used as a subtitle there. So it's kind of interesting how God designed this thing, you know, setting it all, laying it out in this way. And uh, like I said, the beginning letter in each verse uh, uses that letter. And also, uh, as most of you know, the gematria is made up of letters which represent numbers. So you're looking at the letters here that represent the numbers too. So Psalm 119, I think, is um, most important in pointing us to grace to learn how to get God's cooperation through prayer to make it cause us to be someone that we're normally, naturally not, and uh, to cause us to receive His grace. To pray, because these are prayers. You know, when you read down through, you'll see prayer after prayer after prayer here, uh, or meditations upon God and His Word, sometimes spoken of as the law, you know. So it's... um. It's a very, very important chapter. I I think I taught on it maybe three years ago, somewhat, and um, I just love it. And uh, it just uh, points a person towards grace from God. In other words, if you have any trust in yourself, um, you're going to fail. If you have any trust in man, you're going to fail. But if you've got trust in God through prayer, you've asked Him to help you to be someone that you naturally are not you ask you're asking him to create in you the word of god which makes you a son of god and you understand that it comes from god because of his mercy and grace these things are foundational for receiving the grace of god and uh, manifesting the word of god so i think one of the most important verses actually is the first verse here it says blessed are they that are perfect in the way. You know, the word blessed here is uh, Asherah, and it means um, happy, very happy. There are other verses, there are other words in the Hebrew that are also translated blessed. There's one that just means happy. This one means happy, very happy. (laughs) Blessed are they, happy, very happy are they, that are perfect in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Perfect in the way. Glory be to God. What's the difference between perfect and perfect in the way? Well, obviously, perfect is a manifestation of God's purity and righteousness and and, uh, so on. But perfect in the way means that He counts you as perfect where you are along the road or along the path, right? 
And uh, glory be to God. That's what grace is all about, is that God can accept us as perfect. We reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. He accepts us as perfect because we're walking in the light that we have. You know, the Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So, walking in the light, walking in the light that you have. God considers a perfect, a person perfect in the way when they're walking in the light that they have. You can't do any better than that until you reach manifest perfection, which the Bible also teaches. And if you don't believe it, just look, get your concordance out and look up perfection. We're, of course, not going to look at all those today, but I'd like to just say a few words about this perfect in the way thing. They're perfect in the way if you're walking in the law, he says here, which is just another way of saying the word to them. If you're walking in the law, not standing, you know, but but walking in the law. And we're told in uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18 that the path of the righteous is as the dawning light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And, uh, you know, as we walk along the path, perfect in the way, walking in the light, the light grows brighter and brighter. It's like the dawning of the day. The sun goes up higher and higher. And the perfect day, of course, I would suspect represents the sun being straight up when there is no shadows, no darkness. The, The darkness has been totally conquered by the light of the Sun, S-O-N, sun. And uh, that's the path of the righteous. And uh, what God is saying is along this path, if you're walking in obedience to the light that you do have, that's the very best you can do. You are accounted as righteous. You know, the Bible says faith is accounted as righteousness. Oh, praise the Lord. And so, In Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Meaning, of course, the word shows us where we're standing right now, and it shows us where we need to go. If we're definitely doing that, if we are repentant of anything that we're doing now, and we're walking by faith in where we need to go, and we're walking in the light that we have, then you can't do any better than that. And God calls that, I believe, is what he's calling, perfect in the way. They walk in the law. You know, Genesis chapter 6, in verse 9, let me read that to you, concerning Noah. It says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. What does it mean, perfect in his generations? Well, he was perfect according to the knowledge that was given to him in those days and um, in relationship to the people around him in those days. Obviously, there was very few people that God uh, accounted grace to, but the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he was, of course, in the ark because God considered him a righteous and an upright person. And, uh, you know, God spoke to Abraham uh, and told him to be perfect. God spoke to Israel in Deuteronomy 18 and told them to be perfect. It's God's command that we be perfect. It's not something that we can do without grace. When God commands you to do something, it's kind of like when Uh, God spoke to Ezekiel and told him to stand up. But then the Spirit of the Lord in him stood him up. And uh, you know what God commands, the Holy Spirit will do. We can do nothing by our own power, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we know that Christ did this. He did strengthen us. He gave us the grace back at the cross. You know, so if we uh, walk in the light, I believe God is calling us, those people who are perfect in the way. 
And I'll read to you uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22, uh, 31 through 33. It says, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield unto them that take refuge in Him. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? God is my strong fortress, and He guideth the perfect in His way. Well, praise God. You know, this is what the Lord wants to do with every one of us. Uh, There are some people, because of their doctrine, they really can't walk in the way perfect. Their doctrine uh, literally destroys them. Um, They're not able because they're not empowered by the greasy grace uh, that's been pushed on Christianity. Uh, You know, unless we believe that God expects us to be obedient to His Word, number one, and number two, that we can be obedient to His Word if we will uh, walk by faith in Him as our supplier, as our uh, the power that we need to do this. Like I said, the Holy Spirit stood up in Ezekiel at God's command. Uh, The same will happen to us if we have faith in Him and not in ourselves. He will give us His grace, and He will cause us to to overcome. You know, 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9 says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards Him. And then, of course, He rebuked Asa, he said, Herein hast thou done foolishly, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. And of course Asa was wroth with the seer and uh, put him in the prison house. And Asa Asa actually died because he didn't trust in the Lord, but he trusted unto the physicians. But at any rate, the Lord is just looking for those whose heart is perfect towards him. And... um, He says that he will show himself strong in behalf of them. You know, is your heart in a, uh, do you desire to be obedient to God's word or do you desire to justify yourself? Do you desire to have grace and just forgiveness rather than the ability to serve God? Do you want to serve yourself and justify yourself and accept this greasy grace? Or do you really want to serve God? Well, if you want to serve God, God says that's the person he's looking for. And um, and he said he would show himself strong in behalf of that person. Well, that's what we need. We all need that. None of us can uh, walk in the light without God's grace. And this is what the prayers in Psalm 119 are all about. They're all about us learning to walk in the grace of of God, and asking God to be a partner with us in in giving us this grace and manifesting this power in us. Job 1 and 8 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? For there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and turneth away from evil. Uh, This is what, of course, God expects of us. You know, Job Job wasn't held accountable for everything that we have and understand in the New Testament. It's obvious, you know, from the Scriptures. But he desired to serve God. He uh, loved God enough that he uh, committed his life to God. He had things he didn't understand about himself. There were things wrong in his life that he didn't know about. But when God called him a perfect and upright man, it was because he wasn't attributing to him the things that he didn't see about himself. And in fact, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. God attributes sin to the person who knows something is wrong, and they do it anyway. If we walk in the light that we have, we can do no better. We can do no better until God gives us more light. And that's the whole point about walking in the light. You're not standing in the light you're walking in the light. Some people are just standing in the light. They, they, Their doctrine hadn't changed in years. They don't know anything more about the Lord than they did years ago. 
They're just uh, standing in the light, but they're not walking in the light. They're not look, searching out the direction of the Lord. He might be uh, a lamp unto their feet, but he's not a light unto their path. And so, you know, unless a person seeks out the will of the Lord, seeks more light to walk in, they're not really uh, perfect in the way. Perfect in the way is to walk in the law of the Lord. You know, some people are quite satisfied that their religion has told them all they need to know about the Lord. They don't have much interest in God, though, do they? They really don't have much interest in God. They just want their religion to tell them they're okay. And, of course, that they're forgiven. Never mind overcoming. Never mind being holy. Uh, They have no interest in that. Uh, Of course, if they did, they would be seeking God in His Word every day, no matter what their religion believed. They would be delivered of idolatry with that religion, and they would be walking in the law of God. Praise be to God. So, now I'll read one more in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 19. He that is steadfast in righteousness shall attain unto life, and he that pursueth evil doeth it to his own death. They are perverse in heart. They that are perverse in heart are an abomination to the Lord. But such as are perfect in their way are his delight. So, The person who walks in the law or walks in the Word of God or walks in the light of God is somebody that's continually walking in new light. And uh, this is the one that God really loves. And let me tell you, this is the one that really loves God because they never get enough knowledge about God. They want to know God. It's important for them to know God. That's what loving God is. And, of course, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You're not only going to see the light, you're going to walk in the light, right? They're going to keep these commandments. And in Psalm 119 and verse 2, again, we start with the word blessed, uh, ashireh, happy, very happy, are they that keep his testimonies. Praise the Lord. It's sad that most of Christianity doesn't believe that we can do this because they don't believe the gospel, the good news, that Jesus actually delivered us from our sin and gave us his righteousness. We've been empowered by the knowledge of what happened at the cross to be able to walk with the Lord, to walk perfect in the way. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that keep him with the whole, that seek him, excuse me, with the whole heart seek Him. They constantly want to know more about God. It's more important to them than football. It's more important to them than TV. It's more important to them than hobbies. A person who's in love with God, He is their hobby. And uh, they're drawn by Him, like the Shulamite in Song of Solomon, to run after Him. They're drawn by Him. They desire Him. They desire to know Him more about Him. It's their consuming interest. They wake up in the morning talking to Him, thinking about Him, right? He says, Yea, they do no unrighteousness. They walk in His ways. See, God doesn't attribute unrighteousness to these people. People do. Christians do. Christians might have more light than other Christians, and they may judge other Christians as though they should be walking in their light. But actually, we're just held accountable to walk in our light, right? That's why we have to be careful when we deal with other Christians. We are accountable for what we know. To him that doeth, knoweth to do good, and doeth it not. To him it is sin. So be careful, because... We're all coming from different directions towards the same Lord. And uh, I might not have the knowledge you have, and you might not have the knowledge I have, but if I'm walking in my knowledge and you're walking in yours, then we are right before God. They do no unrighteousness. They walk in His ways. And obviously these ways are like the highway of holiness. They lead us to Zion. They lead us to the Lord himself. In Zion is the king, King David, Jesus Christ, right? 
So they lead us to the Lord himself. These highways all over the world leading to Zion. Thou hast commanded us thy precepts, that we should observe them diligently. Well, you know, it's for our own good. It's not only to serve God. We can do nothing to serve God if we don't walk in the Word, and the Word doesn't live in us, because the Word in us is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But it's for our own good. You know, the owner's manual tells you how to take good care of the vehicle, right? Well, we've got this vehicle that we have to take care of and so that it can serve God. It is a, a means to an end. You know, this life that we lead, this body that we live in, this the family or, you know, or, or the associations, so on and so forth, the Lord tells us how to keep them in good working order. And um, it says that we should observe them diligently. You know, the word observe here, some of your Bibles probably have keep them diligently, which is a good translation too. Shamar, I believe, is the word, and it means to keep, to guard. Uh, it's used quite often through Psalm 119. It's sad to say that in these days, observe, to most people's thinking, is just uh, to look on. In other words, to, yeah, I know what you want, Lord. I can see what it says in your book, you know. But observe, when this was written, Shamar meant to keep it, to obey it. To walk in it, you know, uh, to to guard it, right? That we should observe them diligently. Oh, that my ways were established to observe thy statutes. So we we see what walking in the way, perfect in the way, uh, is. It is to observe. Once again, keep thy statutes. We. You know, we, from very young Christians on up, uh, begin walking in what we know of God's statutes. And the more we understand of them, the more we're accountable to do that. To whom much is given, much is expected, the Lord says. So he said, oh, that my ways were established as though it was something that God could do to help us here. And indeed, the rest of Psalm 119 tells us that very much. We, I don't know exactly who wrote Psalm 119. I don't know that anybody does. But the facts are, whoever it was had a very good understanding of grace and how that we need God every day to be able to continue to walk in, in the way of perfection or perfect in the way, right? Oh, that my ways were established to observe thy statutes. I would say that he is talking about more, uh, not only where I'm walking now, but where I'm going to be walking in the future. We know that we're not only perfect in the way, but we're walking towards per perfection, which is maturity in Christ, right? Uh, Christ being manifest in us. So once again, he, he, you can see from this statement that he's not really trusting in himself. And he's wishing that he was walking in all of the statutes of God, which we should all be, and which we should diligently seek out his ways every day, diligently seek his word every day to find out what exactly it is to walk in the steps of Jesus Christ, right? Verse 6 says, then shall I not be put to shame. Wow, that's awesome. You know, because if we walk uh, observing the Lord's statutes, we will not be put to shame. That's a blessing from God, right? And it's a very good reason for us to continue to seek out His ways and to be established to walk in His ways so that we will not be put to shame. And when I have respect unto all thy commandments, then shall I not be put to shame when I have respect unto all thy commandments. It sounds a lot like Hosea 4 and 6, right? Where we're told that um, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And because you have rejected knowledge, I have rejected you that you should be a priest unto me, he said. And he went on to talk about rejecting their children because of this, and on and on and on. You know, we leave an inheritance to our children. The righteous leave an inheritance to their children. And, uh, you know, they you raise them up in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. 
Praise be to God. So it's very important that our ways are established in the Lord so that we're not put to shame and so that we respect all of His commandments so that we're not going to be put to shame. Multitudes of God's people are being put to shame because they're in rebellion against the Word and it's there for them. All they would have to do is go and read it and study it and God would point this out to them. If they desired truth and to walk in truth, there's no problem. You know, if any man is willing to do the will of the Father, Jesus said, he shall know of the teaching. Anybody that truly wants the truth, they will find it. That's what Jesus said. They will find it. The Lord will reveal it to them. He will put his desires in their heart, right? And verse 7 says, I will give thanks unto thee with uprightness of heart when I learn thy righteous judgments. A person is truly manifestly upright in heart when they learn of his righteous judgments. We, we need to be able to judge the way God judges. We get in so much trouble when we miss in judgment, when we judge out of context or out of order. We bring ourselves into so much curses, so many curses because of that right there. In fact, it's better until you know to not do any judging, right? Now, who art thou, O man, that judges? Romans chapter 2 warns us. And when you judge others, you judge yourself. And uh, that's true. When man judges, when Christians judge as man judges, they bring judgment upon themselves. And so we don't want that. A person can be delivered of great judgment if they would just keep their mouth shut and don't judge when they when they don't know right self-righteousness causes us to judge before the time the bible tells us judge nothing before the time paul said when the lord will bring to light the hidden things of darkness there are things we don't see god sees very well he can judge he can even show us judgment but if we judge according to our our small thinking we always get ourselves in trouble. We bring curses upon ourselves. And so I, the, the best advice, of course, is don't judge until God brings things to light, and, and it's His judgment, right? As Paul said in Corinthians. Verse 8, I, I will observe thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. I will observe, or I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Well, notice there was eight verses in the first, the Aleph, or the number one, <laughs> or the A. There was eight verses here, and every other one of these has eight verses after the letter of the, the Aleph Bet, which is the way the Hebrews call it, the Aleph Bet. And Bet, you know, the second one, starts another eight verses here, and they're all, they all begin with the Bet. And on and on, all 22 letters uh, have eight verses behind them, and they all handle it the same way. And uh, verse 9 says, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? His way, perfect in the way. We, we need to, Our way needs to be more and more perfect. You know, we may be walking perfectly in the way where we are right now, but we don't want to get off the path. We want it to be the way, right? And the question is, how shall a person who's immature in the Lord cleanse his way, make sure he's on a righteous path, you know? It says, by taking heed thereto unto thy word. You know, we need to constantly renew our mind with what is the way of the Lord. The book of Acts spoke about, they spoke many times about being in the way right? The way of the Lord, the way of the path of God, the steps of Jesus, right? Let everyone that says they abide in Him walk as He walked, First John tells us. So we need a person who loves the Word of God, who has this awesome gift from God. If you don't have it, you can get it, because He's going to tell you in this chapter how to get it, how to uh, fall in love with the Word, how to have grace from God in your heart to be who you need to be, He's going to tell you very plainly. And it 
believe it or not, it's not up to you by your own willpower to pick yourself up and put yourself in this place. It is a gift from God, and the person who wrote Psalm 119 knew very well that this was a gift from God, but they also knew that God would give this gift, or they wouldn't have wasted their time praying for it. And so this is exactly what we're going to see in, you know, in this chapter. Taking heed unto thy word, God will give us this gift to take heed unto his word so that we can see what a clean path is, what the perfect in the way means, right? Verse 10 says, With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Praise the Lord. Listen to this. This is grace, right? You're seeing someone who understands grace. Let me not wander from thy commandments. Can God put it in our heart to not wander from his commandments? It's, it's grace from him, of course. With my whole heart have I sought thee. You know, this is a person who loves after God, seeks after God, uh, taking heed unto his word. They have, a, they have a right to grace, and God will give it to them because these are the people that God said he loved. And um, let me not wander from thy commandments. You know, David, I don't know that David wrote Psalm 119. I don't know that he did. I, I, I don't think so. But at any rate, David had a um, uh, tremendous understanding about grace. And uh, I'm going to read you something from First Chronicles 29, starting in verse 10. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And David said, Blessed be thou, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou rulest over all. And in thy hand is power and might. This is it, folks. This is where we have to devote our attention. We need power and might. It's totally contrary to human nature to walk on the path of God. And the only one that can walk on the path of God is God himself. And he can give us this gift, and he will give us this gift. Uh, in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. We, if we're going to have power to walk in the steps of Jesus Christ, we're going to get it from God. And if you're going to get it from God, you first of all have to be interested in it. You have to be interested in walking on this path of perfection. If you don't, God knows it. If you're making flippant prayers for the sake of making flippant prayers, and it's not an effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man who desires earnestly to walk in the steps of Jesus, God knows it. Okay. If you need that desire to walk in the steps of Jesus, God has that. You can ask him for that, and he will give that. And verse 13 says, Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? Now, why in the world do we have a will to do this? Well, he just said, you know, it's in thy hand to make great and to give strength unto all. But who are we? What is this people that you have given this grace unto us? This little Israel, you know, and uh, this little church. What is it that you have given to this little church? Why have you given this to us? Is there any reason for this? Is there any logical reason for this? Well, that God chose you, that God gives grace, this is all true things. And, and if you ask him for it, he will give it. He probably would put it in your heart to ask him for it so that he could give it to you. It is all by grace from beginning to end. That we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort. God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. For all things come of thee. 
uh, you know, obviously the grace to be able to offer willingly comes from God. And of thine own have we given thee. See, nobody can really brag about what they give to God, what they do for God, or how they walk with God, because it's all coming from Him. Of thine own have we given thee. And you know what? When we understand that it is by grace and we walk as though it's by grace, this really enhances our relationship with the Lord. As long as we think like we can do it, we can handle it, Lord, step back, God, let me through, you know. Well, um, that doesn't really enhance our relationship with the Lord. He doesn't give grace to the arrogant. You know, he gives grace to the humble. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are as a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee a house, for thy holy name cometh of thy hand, and is all thine own. You know, God is building a house. Uh, his Davids, too, are going to build a house here in the New Testament. He, his sons of David are going to build a house here in the New Testament. It's not a physical house. It's a spiritual house. But every stone in that house is a creation of God. It is a child of God. It's a creation of God. And it all comes from his hand. And it's all his own. He is building this house. He is using this clay, these clay vessels, and uh, what he's putting on the inside to build these houses. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. Of course, again, he just got through saying that this ability to willingly offer in verse 14 came from God. So he's fully admitted that. And now have I seen with joy thy people that are present here, offering willingly unto thee. O Lord, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people. See, it is a gift for God to keep this in our hearts constantly while we seek him and desire after him and become that temple that he so wants in the earth and to prepare their heart unto thee, and give unto Solomon my son a perfect heart, to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do all these things, and to build the palace uh, for, for which I have made provision. Just a little taste of the understanding of the grace that, that David had, you know, that everything that we are comes from God, all that we're going to be comes from God, and we have to make sure that First and foremost, we're asking God for these things. God can work it in us. He will do it if we ask Him to. And that's what these prayers in Psalm 119 are all about, is that we would understand this and that we would ask for this. And verse 11 of Psalm 119 says, Thy word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. You put the word of God in your heart, it is the Word that um, enables us not to sin against God because the Word is what gives us life, the life of God. Matter of fact, verse 50 of this same chapter says, This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy Word hath quickened me. The word quickened means gives life to. The Word of God gives us life. He said, Thy word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Stay close to the word. Get good habits of study. You know, uh, every day study the word of God. Let God know that you think this is more important to you than the things of the world. Um, so study the word of God every day. Put it before your eyes every day. Verse 93 of this chapter says, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. With them thou hast made me alive. If you're dead, there's nothing you can do to serve God. 
But if you've got his Zoe life, because the word abides in you and you love the word and you love to seek out God, then you won't be sinning against him. This, this we need, diligent search after God. You know, the Shulamite said, draw me. We will run after thee. It's very interesting. That's a prophetic revelation there that the Shulamite represents a we. Draw me. We will run after thee. She understood grace. She understood that there's no possibility of us running after God unless we ask him to draw us to run after him. And the Shulamite represents the bride, the corporate bride. That's why she said, we will run after thee. One nineteen and 12 says, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Amen. You know, I, the most diligent prayer I prayed, I've told you when I was young, was, Lord, I want to know the truth. Give me the truth. And I tell you, God can answer that to the uttermost. Matter of fact, let me see. Look in First uh, Kings. Uh, this just came before my eyes recently. First Kings chapter three, and verse twelve. I said to the Lord, Lord, give me a word. This was in September of two thousand and five. I said, Lord, give me a word. I flipped my Bible open and stuck my finger down on. Right on 12, verse 12, the number 12. I stuck my finger right on it, so I read the verse. It said, Behold, I have done according to thy word. <laughs> yeah, I asked him for a word, right? He said, Behold, I have done according to thy word. I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there hath been none like unto thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Well, you know, when I was very young in the Lord, I told you that the Lord kept putting this prayer in my heart. Lord, I want to know the truth. Lord, show me wonders out of your word. Psalm 119 speaks about that too. Reveal to me your truth. Open my understanding. Give me eyes to see. I prayed these prayers over and over and over. And, uh, and the Lord sent prophets to me to tell me that he was going to give me wisdom and understanding for his church. Well, so I got this, this right here on um, September the 18th of 05. And then I said, well, okay, Lord. I asked the Lord another thing. I said, Lord, give me your wisdom because of that verse. I said, Lord, give me your wisdom. I closed my Bible. I opened it up again, stuck my finger down on this word, of, of. But it was the wisdom of Solomon. I stuck my finger down right in the middle of that. And that's in uh, 1 Kings uh, 4, and 34. And there, there came of all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom, so on and so forth. God is the only one that can do that. But if you ask him to, you can't take any credit for it when he does do it. But if you ask him to, he will do it. If you ask him to give you grace, he will do it. If you ask him to give you truth, if you ask him uh, that you might not sin against him, if you ask him these things, he will do it. He promised to do it. Jesus promised to do it. All things, whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them, and you shall have them. Wow. <laughs> this is awesome. This is a really good deal that the Lord's given us. We, we need to ask him all things. We need to ask him everything. Because we're letting him know when we do that, that we don't believe we can do it without his help, but we believe he will give us his help. That's what you do when you pray, right? You're letting God know that, aren't you? And uh, believe me, that's the relationship he wants with people. He doesn't, doesn't like self-righteous people. There's really nothing in man that would enable them to approach unto God. Blessed is the man that thou chooses and causes to approach unto thee. That's what he said. You know, he causes you to approach unto him. Oh, glory to God. This is the understanding of grace that we've got to have in order to have a right relationship with the Lord. That's what Psalm 119 teaches about our relationship with the Word and how we can come to know it and how we can be taught it and how the Lord will give us the gifts in it. 
Blessed art thou, O Lord, verse 119 and 12, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the ordinances of thy mouth. So we are agreeing with God's word. How can two walk together except they be agreed? With our mouth, we need to say what God says. We need to agree with His promises towards us in order to have His miracles and provisions. We need to agree with His word. Uh, Let God be true and every man a liar that thou mightest be justified in thy words and might prevail when thou comest into judgment, Paul said in Romans chapter 3, right? We want to prevail in judgment. We want to be blessed as we walk through this wilderness world, you know, and it'll come because we put our trust in Him. Amen? With thy, my lips have I declared all the ordinances of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Well, you know, are God's testimonies more valuable to you than all riches? Anything of this world, any hobby, any person, anything. Well, you know, I think that's one reason God in this in these days is taking away all of man's toys, all of the prosperity. He's doing it, folks. If you haven't seen it yet, you will soon. He is doing it because it's an idolatry. You know, the Bible says if the love of the world is in you, the love of the Father is not. So we need to repent because we need to rejoice in his testimonies more than all the riches, anything in this world, right? I will, and if you don't have this, ask God for it, as, I, as we were speaking. I will meditate on thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Praise God. We will do these things when we understand that God gives grace to do these things. And, and it's there for the asking. I will meditate on thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. You know, let's, let's speak and agree with our prayers. Let's ask these things of God. We need to diligently seek the Lord. We need to diligently put His Word into our hearts. We need to do this every day. The cumulative effect of seeking God and His Word at the end of a lifetime is tremendous. But fools run around seeking the world and the things of the world and twitter away this awesome gift that God said He would give us. The cumulative effect of of diligently seeking the Lord every day, laying aside time for the Lord every day to seek Him in His Word and to put His Word in our hearts and to meditate on His precepts and delight delight ourselves in His statutes. This is what is going to cause us to mature very quickly. I know a lot of people entered the kingdom. I knew a lot of people who entered the kingdom at the same time I did. And I tell you, very few of them are still with God today. And, and, and some of them are not very mature in the Lord. They're still caught up in dead religion and so on and so forth. But uh, God gave grace to me to desire to continue to run after Him. And I look around me and a lot of those people aren't with me anymore. And, uh, you know, every one of us needs to seek God for His grace to be what we cannot be otherwise. And He will give us that grace. And verse 17 says, Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live. Amen. There's there's an understanding of grace. You give it to me, Lord, and I'll live. Deal bountifully with me and I will live. And so will I observe thy word. I'm going to read to you Romans chapter 9. It would do good for everybody to read Romans chapter 9. It's a revelation of God's grace to God's chosen vessels, right? I'm going to read 15 and 16. It says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it's not of him that willeth, 
In other words, you can't work this up in yourself. Nor of him that runneth. You're not powerful enough to please God. Right? But of God that has mercy. We have no hope except for God having mercy upon us. And frankly, the fact that he has drawn you to him and given you a new spirit means that he has given you the right to come boldly before his throne and ask for everything you need, everything you need, right? including mercy. And I like 22 and 23, too. He says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath fitted unto destruction? and that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he afore prepared unto glory. He is preparing and has prepared and prepared actually from the foundation of the world um, vessels of mercy. And why putting? Why does he put up so patiently with these vessels of wrath? So that there might be a comparison. You know, people can clearly look out there and see who's got grace from God and who doesn't, and what it takes to have grace from God and what will cause you to miss out. And, of course, Psalm 119 does the exact same thing. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live, so will I observe thy word. You give me grace, Lord, I will observe your word. There are many people, many worthless people, people among the people of God have no desire to serve Him. They have a desire to be seen and admired by men. They have many selfish ambitions, but they're really not seeking to be godly. And verse 18, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Boy, this is a good one here. God's got so many things, so many hidden things in His Word that would just excite us, and He can show us these things. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, and it's the glory of kings to seek it out, right? Praise God. Lord, open my eyes. Another good prayer. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of Thy law. Grace, as comes grace. If we ask God for truth, He will give us truth. And you don't necessarily do it overnight. But if we ask Him for it, again, the accumulative effect before the end of our life will bring all these things to pass. He said, I am a sojourner in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. Many things are hidden. First, we've got to have a love to seek them out, a love to search out the Word, a love to find out what it is that pleases God and find out what it is that doesn't please God. If you love God, you'll do that. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's what he said. Don't hide your commandments from me, Lord. That's what he's saying. Reveal them to me. Help me to understand them. And verse 20 says, My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thine ordinances at all times. That's a gift from God right there. That is a gift from God. Not everybody gets that. You know, in the parable of the sower, it's a sad thing when you read that to realize that many people start out with God, they get distracted, and the seed that God sowed in their heart gets plucked up or dies, withers from the sun, gets taken over by the thorns, uh, so on and so forth. But to have this desire all of your life, to know God's ordinances at all times, to have this longing in your heart, that's a gift from God. Go to Him and ask Him for it. He will give it to you. Thou hast rebuked. I've had times, folks, I have to tell you, <clears throat> all of my Christian life, I don't think I've ever backslidden in my Christian life. I haven't ever backslidden in my Christian life. I've never backslid. I've made mistakes. I've failed. But I've always desired after God. And every time I feel this desire waning for the Word of God and for truth, I go to God. And I ask him to bring it back. And he brings it back. For more 
more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.